the above entitled matter as to count one, unintentional second degree murder while committing a felony, find the defendant guilty. It is the video that shocked the world. Former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin putting his knee on George Floyd's neck for more than nine minutes. Floyd died on the scene today, the jury calling it murder. Thank you for joining us tonight. As you just heard, the 12 person jury has found Derek Chauvin guilty of second and third degree murder and manslaughter in the death of George Floyd. This is the trial the world is watching and many in Minneapolis have been anticipating this verdict. Our Barrett Leone is live in Minneapolis tonight to share how those watching feel tonight. Barrett. Hi, Tom, Caitlin. I'm here in downtown Minneapolis at 7th Street and 2nd Avenue. And moments ago, we had a big caravan ride through down 7th Street, all celebrating this conviction. A lot of emotions today. A lot of uh, emotions were high, joy, tears. Here's a little bit of what we captured this afternoon. This is just the beginning. We're going to keep fighting. We're going to keep fighting. And we're going to go after the other issues as well. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful day in our city. Uh, uh, again, a step in the right direction. So now we just need more accountability on all grounds. The ex-officer uh, been acquitted. We were prepared for that too. I can't believe it. This is mind blowing. 98.7% of, of the time. A cop to kill someone doesn't get charged with a crime, let alone convicted on all three. That's crazy. I feel great! Yes! Thank you! Hi! Now, among those in the crowd today was George Floyd's girlfriend, Courtney Ross, and she says this conviction is a step in the right direction. What really made me feel uh, just a huge sense of relief and the pressure got lifted is when I looked at Tashira, my friend who had lost her fiance, and I could see that this is going to be a moment of change. This is going to start something different. People that have suffered in the past are going to get to reopen their cases. They're going to be looked at again and hopefully find some justice. And again, like I said, there's a lot of emotions here today, both celebratory and joyful, but there also is this sense of the work is not done yet. And folks here in Minneapolis say they won't stop until policing reform happens. For now, reporting live in Minneapolis, Barrett Leone, KTTC News. Barrett, thank you. At the same time, the family of George Floyd's reaction to the verdict can be summed up in one word, relief. I feel relieved today that I finally have the opportunity to, for hopefully getting some sleep. Uh, a lot of days that I, I prayed and I hoped and I was speaking everything into existence, I said I have faith that he will be convicted. So many emotions right now, but I'm very thankful and grateful. And our Camaria Bray watched the trial from the very beginning. She is live from Minneapolis. And Camaria, what can you say about how this trial went? Well, Tom, it's a historic day here in Minneapolis. April 20th, a day people won't forget. After 10, 10 hours of deliberating that jury, finding Derek Chauvin guilty of all three charges. And here in Minneapolis, it was a celebration. And also at George Floyd Square, it was also a celebration. Now, throughout this trial, the court has heard from more than 40 witnesses and has watched that May 25th video of George Floyd with a knee on his neck for nearly 10 minutes from multiple angles. Now, the prosecution coming out victorious, holding a strong case that Chauvin caused Floyd's death. Meanwhile, the defense has been saying it was other factors such as drugs, but in the end, the verdict stands. Let's hear a clip from yesterday's closing arguments that led up to today's verdict. It's exactly what you saw with your eyes. It's exactly what you knew. It's what you felt in your gut. It's what you now know in your heart. This wasn't policing. This was murder. The defendant is guilty of all three counts.
Now we heard that from inside the courtroom, George Floyd's baby brother Felonis hugged prosecutor, state prosecutor Jerry Blackwell after that a, ver a verdict was announced. And we're about a block away from the Hennepin County courtroom. And as you heard earlier, Courtney Ross, George Floyd's girlfriend was in the crowd and Maurice Hall, the man who went to cup foods with Floyd was also there. Celebrations I'm sure will be going on for a while. But as we heard earlier, the work is still not done for many people who feel that there's still more justice to be made. So in Minneapolis, Kamaria Bray, KTDC News. Kamaria, thank you. Civil rights attorney who is representing the Floyd family is calling today a win. America, let's frame this moment as a moment where we finally are getting close to living up to our Declaration of Independence, that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equally, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that amongst them are life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Where America, that means all of us. Lead prosecutor for the case, Attorney General Keith Ellison and his team also reacted after the guilty verdict, saying that today is a culmination of gathering the facts. When I became the lead prosecutor for the case, I asked for time and patience to review the facts, gather evidence, and prosecute for the murder of George Floyd to the fullest extent the law allowed. I want to thank the community for giving us that time and allowing us to do our work. That long, hard, painstaking work has culminated today. I would not call today's verdict justice, however, because justice implies true restoration but it is accountability. Olmstead County Attorney Mark Ostrom also weighs in on the Chauvin verdict. He says he does not feel the jury felt pressured to sway a certain way. I really didn't get the feeling that there was a lot of intense pressure, you know, that outward political, small p political pressure uh, on them. It, uh, I think just given the way the, ju the judge had instructed them that they were uh, very well prepared for the decision they were about to make. And you're here for a certain reason. Attorney Ostrom says it is clear the prosecution laid out a very strong case. Rochester criminal justice attorney Jim McGinney also says the court system did its job, but he says the country has a long way to go. A, a black man in America has to worry about things that a white man doesn't. A black woman has to worry about things that a white woman might not necessarily have to worry about. But I don't know if I can pick any one major thing that came out of this trial other than, uh, you know, uh, justice happened. Justice was served. Comments by the high-profile Democratic Congresswoman Maxine Waters could fuel any potential appeal from the defense in the trial of Derek Chauvin. Judge Peter Cahill criticized the California Congresswoman who over the weekend urged protesters in Minnesota to get more confrontational if the former police officer is not convicted for the death of George Floyd. Chauvin's lawyer asked the judge to declare a mistrial over her statements, arguing that she had prejudiced the jury. We are turning now to President Joe Biden, who is going to be speaking, reacting to this conviction. Good evening. First, I want to thank the jury for their service. And I want to thank Mr. Floyd's family for your steadfastness. Today, we feel a sigh of relief. Still, it cannot take away the pain. A measure of justice isn't the same as equal justice. This verdict brings us a step closer. And the fact is, we still have work to do. We still must reform the system. Last summer, together with Senator Cory Booker and Representative Karen Bass, I introduced the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. This bill would hold law enforcement accountable and help build trust between law enforcement and our communities. This bill is part of George Floyd's legacy. 
the President and I will continue to urge the Senate to pass this legislation, not as a panacea for every problem, but as a start. This work is long overdue. America has a long history of systemic racism. Black Americans, and black men in particular, have been treated throughout the course of our history as less than human. Black men are fathers, and brothers, and sons, and uncles, and grandfathers, and friends, and neighbors. Their lives must be valued in our education system, in our health care system, in our housing system, in our economic system, in our criminal justice system, in our nation. Full stop. Because of smartphones, so many Americans have now seen the racial injustice that black Americans have known for generations. The racial injustice that we have fought for generations, that my parents protested in the 1960s, that millions of us, Americans of every race, protested last summer. Here's the truth about racial injustice. It is not just a black America problem or a people of color problem. It is a problem for every American. It is keeping us from fulfilling the promise of liberty and justice for all. And it is holding our nation back from realizing our full potential. We are all a part of George Floyd's legacy. And our job now is to honor it and to honor him. Thank you. And now it is my great honor to introduce the President of the United States, Joe Biden. Today, a jury in Minnesota found former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin guilty on all counts in the murder of George Floyd last May. It was a murder in the full light of day, and it ripped the blinders off for the whole world to see the systemic racism the Vice President just referred to. The systemic racism is a stain on our nation's soul. <clears throat> the knee on the neck of justice for black Americans. Profound fear and trauma. The pain, the exhaustion that black and brown Americans experience every single day. The murder of George Floyd launched a summer of protest we hadn't seen since the civil rights era in the 60s. Protests that unified people of every race and generation in peace and with purpose to say enough, enough, enough of the senseless killings. Today, today's verdict is a step forward. I just spoke with the governor of Minnesota who thanked me for the close work with his team. And I also spoke with George Floyd's family again. A remarkable family of extraordinary courage. Nothing can ever bring their brother, their father, back. But this can be a giant step forward in the march toward justice in America. Let's also be clear that such a verdict is also much too rare. For so many people, it seems like it took a unique and extraordinary convergence of factors. A brave young woman with a smartphone camera, a crowd that was traumatized, traumatized witnesses, a murder that lasts almost 10 minutes in broad daylight for ultimately the whole world to see, officers 
standing up and testifying against a fellow officer instead of just closing ranks, which should be commended. A jury who heard the evidence carried out their civic duty in the midst of an extraordinary moment under extraordinary pressure. For so many, it feels like it took all of that for the judicial system to deliver a just, just basic accountability. We saw how traumatic and exhausting just watching the trial was for so many people. Think about it, those of you who are listening. Think about how traumatic it was for you. You weren't there. You didn't know any of the people. But it was difficult, especially for the witnesses who had to relive that day. It's a trauma. On top of the fear so many people of color live with every day when they go to sleep at night and pray for the safety of themselves and their loved ones. Again, as we saw in this trial from the fellow police officers who testified, most men and women who wear the badge serve their communities honorably. But those few who fail to meet that standard must be held accountable, and they were today. One was. No one should be above the law. And today's verdict sends that message. But it's not enough. We can't stop here. In order to deliver real change and reform, we can and we must do more to reduce the likelihood that tragedies like this will ever happen and occur again. To ensure the black and brown people, or anyone, so they don't fear the interactions with law enforcement, that they don't have to wake up knowing that they can lose their very life in the course of just living their life. They don't have to worry about whether their sons or daughters will come home after a grocery store run or just walking down the street or driving their car or playing in the park or just sleeping at home. And this takes acknowledging and confronting head-on systemic racism and the racial disparities that exist in policing and in our criminal justice system more broadly. You know, state and local government and law enforcement needs to step up, but so does the federal government. That's why I've appointed the leadership of the Justice Department that I have, that is fully committed to restoring trust between law enforcement and the community they are sworn to serve and protect. I have complete confidence in the Attorney General, General Garland's leadership and commitment. I've also nominated two key Justice Department nominees, Vanita Gupta and Kristen Clark, who are eminently qualified highly respected lawyers who have spent their entire careers fighting to advance racial equity and justice. Vanita and Kristen have the experience and the skill necessary to advance our administration's priorities to root out unconstitutional policing and reform our criminal justice system, and they deserve to be confirmed. We also need Congress to act George Floyd was murdered almost a year ago. There's meaningful police reform legislation in his name. You just heard the Vice President speak of it. She helped write it. Legislation to tackle systemic misconduct in police departments, to restore trust between law enforcement and the people they're entrusted to serve and protect. But it shouldn't take a whole year to get this done. In my conversations with the Floyd family, I spoke with them again today. I assure them we're going to continue to fight for the passage of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act so we can, I can sign the law as quickly as possible. And there's more to do. Finally, it's the work we do every day to change hearts and minds as well as laws and policies. That's the work we have to do. Only then will full justice and full equality be delivered to all Americans. And that's what I just discussed with the Floyd family. The guilty verdict does not bring back George. But through the family's pain, they're finding purpose. So George, George's legacy will not be just about his death, 
but about what we must do in his memory. I also spoke to Gianna, George loves George's young daughter again. When I met her last year, I've said this before, at George's funeral, I told her how brave I thought she was. And I sort of knelt down to hold her hand. I said, Daddy's looking down on you. He's so proud. She said to me then, I'll never forget it, Daddy changed the world. Well, I told her this afternoon, Daddy did change the world. Let that be his legacy, a legacy of peace, not violence, of justice. Peaceful expression of that legacy are inevitable and appropriate, but violent protest is not. And there are those who will seek to exploit the raw emotions of the moment, agitators and extremists who have no interest in social justice, who seek to carry out violence, destroy property, fan the flames of hate and division, who will do everything in their power to stop this country's march toward racial justice. We can't let them succeed. This is a time for this country to come together, to unite as Americans. There can never be any safe harbor for hate in America. I've said it many times, the battle for soul of this nation has been a constant push and pull for more than 240 years. A tug of war between the American ideal that we're all created equal and the harsh reality that racism has long torn us apart. At our best, the American ideal wins out. So we can't leave this moment or look away thinking our work is done. We have to look at it, we have to, we have to look as, as we did for those nine minutes and 29 seconds. We have to listen. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Those are George Floyd's last words. We can't let those words die with him. We have to keep hearing those words. We must not turn away. We can't turn away. We have a chance to begin to change the trajectory in this country. It's my hope and prayer that we live up to the legacy. May God bless you, but may God bless the George Floyd and his family. Thank you for taking the time to be here. This can be a moment of significant change. Thank you. That was President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris giving their reactions to Derek Chauvin being found guilty of all charges. Again, that's the decision from the jury in the Derek Chauvin trial. And uh, Chauvin is now in custody of the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office. Again, the charges were second degree murder, third degree murder, and second degree manslaughter. According to Minnesota state statutes, the second degree unintentional murder charge is punishable by up to 40 years in prison. Third degree murder could be a 25 year max sentence and second degree manslaughter carries a maximum of a 10 year prison sentence. But according to state sentencing guidelines, since Chauvin has no previous convictions, he will most likely get 12 and a half years for the murder charges and four years for manslaughter. Sentencing is scheduled for about eight weeks from now. Again, there are a lot of people out on the streets in Minneapolis right now. Our Barrett Leone is still out in the middle of it. She joins us live with an update. Barrett. Hey, Tom, Caitlin, we are back outside the Hennepin County Government Center where celebrations are still ongoing. As you can see behind me, we've got folks dancing. We've got folks just taking in the moment. Not too long ago, in front of Hennepin County Government Center, we saw this entire street blocked off, 3rd and 7th Street, and a caravan ended up going down 7th Street, chanting, literally dancing in the streets. Now, uh, we are out here at, at, outside the Government Center when that verdict was released. And wow, what a moment that was. It was a raw moment. There was cheering, there was crying, there was hugging. We spoke to one gentleman who was in disbelief that Chauvin was convicted on all three charges. But I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I thought he would get charged with the third degree manslaughter. He'd end up doing three and a half years. He got all three. I can't believe it. It's just been time compound. This doesn't even make sense. This is like incomprehensible. 
what doesn't bring this emotion is the better question. It's just, you know how you put money in the IRA Roth and it just compounds? This just compound emotion over time that we ain't been able to express because we've been in it all non nonstop. And then for this to happen, I can't believe it. see Chauvin convicted, but they also say that the work here isn't done. People in Minneapolis want police reform and say they won't stop until that happens. Reporting live in Minneapolis, Barrett Leone, KTTC News. Thank you. And after the verdict was announced this afternoon, Governor Walls gave a statement to the jury's decision. Take a listen. It's an important step towards justice for Minnesota. Trial's over, but here in Minnesota, I want to be very clear. We know our work just begins. This is the floor, not the ceiling of where we need to get to. Again, Derek Chauvin has been found guilty of all charges. That's the decision from the jury in the Derek Chauvin trial. And Chauvin is now in custody of the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office. And our Camaria Bray joins us from Minneapolis. Camaria, you've been tracking this trial from the very beginning. What's the mood right now? Yeah, Tom, I think today is one of those days where you're going to be thinking and people are going to be asking, where were you when Derek Chauvin was found guilty in all three counts? It's a celebration here. See this guy right here holding up his fist. Now, throughout this trial, the court has heard from more than 40 witnesses and has watched that May 25th video of George Floyd with a knee on his neck, neck for nearly 10 minutes from multiple angles. Now, the prosecution coming out victorious, holding a strong case that Chauvin caused Floyd's death. Meanwhile, the defense has been saying that it was other factors such as drugs, but in the end, the verdict stands. Let's hear a clip from yesterday's closing arguments that led up today's verdict. It's exactly what you saw with your eyes. It's exactly what you knew. It's what you felt in your gut. It's what you now know in your heart. This wasn't policing. This was murder. The defendant is guilty of all three counts. Now, after that verdict in the courtroom, George Floyd's younger brother, Philonis, hugged state prosecutor Jerry Blackwell, happy, I'm sure, and there was plenty of people that are still here and at George Floyd Square celebrating. So in Minneapolis, I'm Kamaria Bray. Back to you. We've been dealing with some chilly conditions across southeast Minnesota and northeast Iowa here to start out the work week, and it looks like we'll have some cold weather on the way for Wednesday as well. Take a look at the temperatures the last 24 hours here. So uh, yesterday at 4 o'clock, we were at about 38, 39 degrees. This morning, we woke up temperatures were all the way down into the lower 20s. We were at 23 to start things off this morning at uh, 6 a.m. and then we warmed up into the 40s uh, for those afternoon highs. As we look at our Lewis and Otto live camera, we continue to have some cloudy skies outside and we'll continue to deal with some cloud cover here through the next couple of hours, seeing some peaks of sunshine every once in a while. We're at 40 right now in Rochester. Winds out of the northwest at about 15 miles per hour. Drops our feel like conditions down into the lower 30s. Our dew points in the mid teens, so not really looking at precipitation, maybe a flurry. Uh, as we move through the evening hours tonight, current temperatures remaining lower 40s, upper 30s is pretty much where we'll stay at through the rest of the evening here, at least through the next couple of hours. Cold conditions on the way tonight. Take a look at uh, some of the alerts we have. We have a freeze warning stretching actually into New Mexico, into the eastern portion of New Mexico, and then all the way into the Ohio River Valley, including portions of Detroit, Michigan, all of Illinois, all of Missouri. So cold conditions not only here, but really across the central portion of the United States. We're not dealing with alerts, but we still have cold conditions on the way tonight. 24 for that overnight low. That means freeze is likely potentially a hard freeze night. So if you have those plants that are sensitive outside, either potted plants, make sure to try to cover them or bring them inside tomorrow evening, Wednesday night and a Thursday morning. Same thing. Freeze looks likely as those overnight lows drop down below 30 degrees. Thursday, we finally have some warm temperatures on the way Thursday night into Friday morning. As we look at satellite radar here, future track radar, notice we see the chance for precipitation, but we're not saturated down towards the surface, so not falling all the way down to the ground. As we move through the overnight hours, we clear skies out just a little bit here. We'll deal with some partly cloudy skies that helps drop our temperatures down tomorrow. We'll see some sunshine in the morning and then increase that cloud cover. High temperatures only expected again, upper 30s, maybe reaching the mid 40s if we can see some sunshine through your day on Wednesday. 
things though change as we move towards Thursday. We'll start to see winds out of the south southwest and watch our temperatures into the 50s. So a little bit more seasonable as we move towards Thursday and Friday. Your town forecast for tonight 24 for that overnight low tonight here in Rochester. As we look at your town forecast for tomorrow, we'll have high temperatures mid 40s. Most of us will see some lower 40s. If we have some cloud cover seven day forecast for us, we look at 59 degrees for the high on Thursday 52 Friday. That's our next chance for some rain. Looks like we have nice conditions as we move towards the weekend. Tom and Caitlin looking forward to those nice conditions. Nick, yeah, right. thank you. We will have the latest from Minneapolis tonight at 10. Thank you for joining us tonight at six. We'll see you back at 10 o'clock. Have a good night.